Hey, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Kahn. I'd like to welcome you to the Training and Development Division and the Five Year Out panel. I think we're really fortunate to have a, a large group of folks uh, here. One of the commonalities among the people up in front is that they've all served as a previous chair or current chair of the Training and Development Division. So we have leadership here going back uh, many, many years. Uh, and people that were, in many cases, program planners and responsible for many of the programs that have been created over the years. What I'd like to do is take a quick moment and have the people uh, say their, their name and their affiliation so you get an <clears> idea. <throat> they are seated in the order of the uh, sheet that I passed out, and we'll start on the far side uh, with J.D. J.D. Wallace, Lubbock Christian University. Don Swanson, Monmouth University. Carrie Stevens, UT Austin. Pete Jorgensen, Western Illinois University. Leanne Grace Starner, Marietta College. Michael Foss, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Scott Dickmeyer, dedicated husband and loving father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'm also at the uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. <laughs> John Berg, <laughs> Arizona State University. <laughs> and I'm Greg Patton from the University of Southern California. The idea today is to go through a, a series of, of looking back and looking forward, uh, looking past at where the division has been and its centrality to NCA. And then to also really look at where the division can go forward, what it can add. And I think that's particularly valuable and useful in terms of what kind of future research, uh, if you're thinking in terms of panels or papers to, to put together. And I think that that's one of the things that can come out of this is a sense of what do we want to really focus on in the next four to five years. In talking about training development, it's somewhat odd. The division's been around for a little over 15 years. Uh, training development's been around a little bit longer than that, uh, before universities, before apprenticeships, uh, for thousands and thousands of years. So one of the challenges, of course, is what does the communication discipline add that, that's unique or different, or how does it move the conversation forward? <laughs> In terms of starting, uh, I would like to look at the historical development within training development of, of NCA. And we have a couple folks who were here really in the early days, in the early 80s, and really start with uh, what were some of the historical developments of training development in the communication discipline. And uh, actually start with Mike and then also Don and, and JD as well in particular. Well, uh, and historical frame, I think, was and an historical moment was created for us by uh, Rebecca Ray, primarily, Karen Krupar, and Mary Mandeville, who were the ones who helped articulate a lot of our individual visions and preferences and hopes uh, that those of us who were in Com Theory and in OrgCom, et cetera, uh, others who came from other divisions but were interested in the actual training and development functions uh, could find some kind of a common home and thanks um, in that last uh, advocacy session with what then was SCA, Rebecca Ray so delightfully articulated what it was that we were interested in and how the communication discipline uh, would be advanced by adding what at that time was called a new commission on training and development. Uh, so thanks to Rebecca and the other two, plus a lot of input from individuals, almost all of whom are here, are here on this panel, uh, SCA approved that new commission. Uh, in those days, you had to have, I believe it was 300 members to qualify or upgrade from commission status to division status, and I believe we did it in record time. It was something like three years or so, and we reached division status. We, I think now at this point, we are, I checked the February 09 data and we're now the 17th largest division in NCA, although today's turnout might not confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> and for frame of reference, there are 45 total divisions within NCA. Uh, we're the 17th largest with a uh, little over 310 uh, members or affiliates actually as they're called. Uh, if you want more frame of reference, the smallest uh, has 88 and the largest has 1,499. Uh, there has to be an asterisk there, though, because 1,499 affiliates really are from rhetoric and com theory, so it's kind of a covering law type of, of division. Uh, I think most excitingly, though, for all of us and hopefully for all of you, uh, we continue to be a home, if that doesn't sound too corny, for those of us who are interested in, in the content and the process 
the theory and the research that directly uh, focuses on the training and development and delivery functions. Don Swanson. Well, I would agree with everything that Mike said. Uh, when I came to this division in the mid-90s, it was like finally finding something that was that I, that I felt really fit some of my strongest interests. I'd been involved in in the Speech Association of America, the Speech Communication Association of America, so on, uh, for, for close to three decades at that point. But it seemed to me that we are always, we've always been an applied discipline where we've taken the things that we learned and knew uh, from our theory and our research and tried to, to improve the quality of life of people in various settings. And since I was also intensely interested in organizational communication, this seemed like a natural place to come and focus on some of the things that I'd been doing because I was someone who really loved you know, doing training work. And what we discovered was that there were a lot of other people like that that didn't quite know where to fit. You know, we sometimes in academe uh, set up some kind of artificial silo groups for, for people that may or may not make sense really for the kind of interest they have. And I've heard a lot of discussion in recent years about how some of the some of the current divisions and groups have changed their focus over a period of time driven by the focus of research but i think what we've done in this division is to broaden the focus of what we do and we are very self-consciously looking at the practice of what we do as well as the theory that drives it and trying to understand it and i think that that's quite distinctly different from some other groups jd yeah, I, I won't add much more except for, as, as you probably already know, uh, the Training and Development Division is a natural nexus for disenfranchised members who are finding themselves being practitioners of training, but also have this uh, academic background in theory. And it certainly uh, gives us a chance for researchers and academics to meet professionals in the training field, and we have a lot to learn from each other. We found that on early on. And so there was this home of people that were trying to do things. You had academics that didn't really know how to do training, but they understood that they had the knowledge base that it could cross-apply. You had trainers that knew how to do training but did not have the knowledge base. And so we formed this home, this natural nexus, if you will, uh, for networking, for opportunities. I think, and uh, certainly we're going to speak to this in, in terms of the panel, uh, that we may be the division whose time has come. And the reason is, is because uh, we're about to, in the next five years, uh, see technology come to more fruition. We are looking at more individualized knowledge spaces. We all have smartphones and, and try to do those things. We have individualized learning environments. There's going to be a need for people to have demands in several places and spaces where they say, we need training on demand in particular situations. And so this, uh, oh, you come to a room, uh, I will prep all that stuff out for you uh, kind of model uh, may not work. And I think that we've been working on a number of these alternative models for a long time. We have individuals that have been doing it, uh, certainly webinar spaces and, and some interesting things in terms of mobile learning environments. Uh, so once again, I think the division is going to become uh, a lot more interesting because the people that are going to be accessing information are not going to be doing it through the traditional venues, but the more personalized venues. And that's the very impetus that brought this division together initially. Uh, it was not the traditional venues, but a need of people that had uh, individualized interests, uh, information on demand or situation, behavioral alteration on demand, uh, in which they uh, uh, wanted to appeal to a space of people that had experience and uh, expertise within those uh, places, and so I think that's where we find ourselves today, uh, certainly with an interesting opportunity uh, to meet a space that has a great need. I do think 15 years in, this is a, a pretty good place to be right now. I think we find a lot of uh, this division as an entry point, uh, where a lot of people who are practitioners who want to come back, uh, a lot of graduate students who want to join the corporate world rather than to go on and be faculty um, have a way to develop skills. And, and we've become this place where we have a, a lot of participants, a lot of people who may come for a couple years 
may be corporate for a couple and then come back. Uh, a lot of people that give the connection to NCA to the outside world, the business world, the corporate world, so there's a home uh, where you don't have to be doing uh, research alone, uh, but can be applying it quite often as well. In terms of the major themes and contributions of training development in the division, what I'd like to ask you to think about is the history, both of training development and also the division, and talk about the themes that have emerged uh, in both those areas. So probably first training development, and Carrie, maybe start with you and, and get some of your thoughts and then go from there. In terms of things, things and contributions? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have come at training and development from a slightly different angle because... Primarily what I do is research. However, I have a love of making sure that the theory that I develop and the research that I do can be applied and be practical. Um, I, I really do feel that, that from a training and development standpoint, we need to be sure that we are doing sound training, and that means relying on research and relying on theory. Yet, I think it's that unique individual who has the ability to translate that type of a language into something that's practical and applied and can be used in a training context. And so I would have to say that that's one of the biggest um, contributions that this division can make. And so one of the things that we see happening is people submit papers to our division that are theoretical. We see people who submit papers that are empirical. They go out and they actually test the effects of various types of training methods. Now, I personally would love, and I think it's shared by everyone here, we would love to see even more of those types of papers come here. Um, but we have a home for those kind of papers. And then we also have very practice-focused, let's try a new technique, let's really look at this and let's flesh it out in a detailed case study or paper. And we have papers such as that that are submitted to training and development as well. And so I think it's this great combination of of theory, empirical research, and practice that kind of underlies most of the, the major themes and contributions that we can make as a division. John? I think some of the other contributions we can make is we can also think about the courses we teach within our institutions. And we've had panels in the past that have started to address yeah. that very specifically. And I think uh, we've talked about certificate programs at certain institutions, at the graduate level. Um, there's generally at least one training development course that we offer in our undergraduate or graduate curriculums. But I think one of the things we can do is inform the development of more scope and sequence related uh, courses and topics because I think our students, both undergraduate and graduate, are very interested in this discipline for obvious reasons because there's great employability potential. But that also means we have to be very good um, boundary spanners, which is really what J.D. mentioned as being the nexus between the academe and corporate environments. And so we also need to be cognizant as we go forward that we need to be very connected with our partners in the ASTD, the American Society for Training and Development, and the International Society for Performance Improvement, who are folks who are also academics but primarily uh, corporate practitioners of state-of-the-art practices relative to technology and some of the technologies that J.D. mentioned, uh, but also the general you know, practice of the field as a profession. So that's the other thing we need to be thinking about long term and the contributions we can make with all the history and everything we've done to date can really inform a plan, I think, going forward that gets us where we want to go for our students uh, academically to provide them um, tracks and courses that make them professionals in the field, but then for ourselves also making sure we're spouting the boundaries we need to span uh, to make sure we're well informed on practices as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those individuals who came to training and development from the opposite direction. Everyone told me I was a great trainer. Everyone told me that I had great programs, and I had no idea why. And somebody said, well, how, did you, how do you develop a program? And I was like, I don't know. I just put some stuff together and do some research, <clears throat> and it turns out. And so when I went back to graduate school and started to come to this organization and this division, it opened my eyes to the fact that there were actually um, theories and research about what makes an effective training program that were applicable and, and could be replicated as opposed to, gee, I don't know, it just seems to work out really good. Yeah. 
I get, I get great evaluations. <laughs> um, and so that really tells me that we need to continue to reach out. Theories are great, but if you can't articulate them in a way that practitioners can understand them and utilize them, then they cease to be anything but mere academic interest. And so as we continue to develop new technologies, for example, um, rapid instructional design, where you can put together an instruction and deliver it to individuals versus a group of people that we need to continue to be cognizant of what theories support that sort of instruction and then continuing to do research to see it if it really is efficacious in terms of practice. Because again, if it can't be applied, then it's not going to be very helpful. So I see us, as everyone has said here, is sort of that great nexus of research and practice. Learning about what we do, learning about what we do and how it impacts others while we continue to help others learn. Pete, what do you see in terms of themes and contributions? Excuse me, I'm just going to... Using the finding a more portable microphones would be first start. No, that's all right. Um, <laughs> in terms of themes and contributions, absolutely. I think the heart and soul of this division, and I think one of the founding principles on which it was based, is really about informed practice. Uh, understanding that there has to be a balance between understanding why we do something and then finding the one thing that works with a great activity, the great skill, the great simulation. Hey, we're having fun, but why is it working? Right. We should be able to provide both ends of that question and, and, and answer. Uh, I think that our ability, specifically as, as communication scholars and practitioners, gives us an advantage in that area. Uh, as I often challenge my students with sort of that thought, if they had that choice of being a content expert or a process expert, which one would they go with? And in training development is understanding the process. The content we can get or we can get somebody to fill in that position. But it's the process of understanding training, understanding the motivation of adult learners, understanding what is it that's going to translate well into a particular need or a particular area for an organization. What is it in fact that they need as they oftentimes are not really all that well aware of what it is they need or what it is they want. And Sometimes those, those two things are, are in conflict. Uh, understanding how to better use technology. Uh, what kinds of technology makes sense for the kinds of goals and the kinds of needs that they have. So when I look at the kinds of ideas about what themes and contributions our division and our people can provide is an understanding about how these various interplays between technology, between the message, between various kinds of goals, behavioral standards, looking at efficacy for various kinds of programs, how these things come up, what theory can do to inform good decision making on putting together programs that achieve those kinds of goals efficiently and successfully for both uh, corporate environments and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, I'd like to echo something that was mentioned uh, briefly here uh, a little while ago as well. Um, in fact, I, I, I think maybe it was uh, it was John who mentioned that we really need to start looking at, uh, in many ways, having an impact on our own institutions. Uh, we take a look at training and development in terms of we understand what motivates adult learners. We understand the importance of content relevance. And yet, how many of us are actually putting those into play in terms of the classroom? Uh, that, the, that the students in there are getting lectured and regurgitating information on tests uh, without any understanding of why this is important. And in fact, it may not be important for their personal and professional goals. And we can start to bring some of our understanding about what makes learning an effective process even at home before taking it out to outside the institution. Scott, what are your thoughts in terms of themes and contributions? Well, it's always a joy to go last. <laughs> <laughs> so we've heard a variety of things and I've been sitting here going, well, I was going to say that. I was gonna say that. Um, well, I have a variety of things that I'm excited to talk about when we look to the future. Uh, I think we've talked about a, a great number of things, but one of the pieces that I think is missing is John tells us essentially a go big or go home. Let's get working with the international training and development organizations, the American STD, uh, STDs, <laughs> ASTD, <laughs> STD. sorry. Don't touch this guy. Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, Hand sanitizer, please. <laughs> <laughs> where, I think that, uh, where I think that we're really missing out, though, is... Uh, I go to a variety of panels from a variety of different divisions throughout NCA, and what I hear consistently espoused is we have to find a way to get our good work past the ivory towers and out to the public that needs them. I think that we can, I've argued for years that I think that this division could be a hub for the entire organization of NCA, mm -hmm. and that uh, we've done some outreach uh, uh, activities in the past, um, and I think that we need to do more of them. Um, 
I was just in a panel this morning where we had brilliant experts talking in ways that uh, confused me on a variety of occasions. <laughs> but at the same time, what consistently came out was, I know that what I've got is impacting, I know that it can make a difference, and I'm just frustrated that we can't seem to get those ideas out to uh, the audiences that need them. And I think that we have uh, a variety of things. We have uh, social construction of reality that can be broken down and laid out in a way. I've done it in my work, at least, in ways that have been really, really helpful to try to uh, allow organizations to see how they can actually be who they claim to be and uh, have their members seeing them as being truthful and honest, and that the challenge is, is that they didn't understand social construction of reality and they were uh, making missteps. Um, I think those are the places where I think would be really interesting is for us to investigate how do we provide those opportunities for the variety of communication scholars uh, to get their words out. All right, thank you. We talked a little bit about themes and contributions. The, the question is really the, the state of the art. What is being produced that really is very good? Uh, when we look at the research, the papers, when, when we review papers, when we see training programs uh, across the board, what, what is the really good stuff that's out there right now? What is that best look like? And open it up to whoever would like to start and get some feedback from several of you. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in there. It's always that awkward silence. Thank you. Got some of the checks in the mail on that one. Um, in terms of what we have to bring, I mean, in, in terms of the resource of what the, the cutting edge kind of stuff out there right now, I think, um, not surprisingly, is, is, is intimately tied in with technology and the use of training. Uh, obviously, we know as training and development experts that the role of training and the popularity of training sort of ebbs and flows depending on how the economy is doing. You know, in times of turbulence, as we're looking at right now, in times of uncertainty, uh, you know, strategic planning and a strategic component of, of organizational planning of which training should be a part often becomes a luxury and gets uh, set aside in, in favor of other kinds of priorities. Uh, and as a result uh, of looking at those things, various other kinds of venues and technologies are considered for can they still supply us with the kinds of learning opportunities and the kinds of training opportunities that our organizations need. Whether we're looking at uh, frontline training, and one of my uh, former graduate students uh, is currently a regional training manager for Caribou Coffee, and she's talking that the extent of those training elements not are not so much tied to strategic goals as preparing the employees for the rollout of new products and those kinds of things coming on. So very much point on, you know, uh, uh, point on delivery kinds of products. Uh, and yet at the other end of the spectrum, you're talking about uh, that we know well from best practices as organizations continue to develop and continue to learn that it's an ongoing assessment process and meeting that need to, e to evolve into the kind of organization that it needs to be. Uh, I think our strengths are in understanding those links between uh, the demands of the environment in which organizations find themselves, recognizing the restrictions that they have to operate within, uh, understanding uh, our links and our boundary spanning abilities to understanding, uh, looking at both theory and application, and having uh, in some way some measure of control and, and content expertise in a variety of areas to be able to provide that information to help them overcome those kinds of times. Don? I was going to say that I, I, I'm increasingly convinced that we are different than a lot of the people who are doing training coming out of other organizations. And this is something I have to try to explain to people like some people who contract for government training, who look only at trainers uh, that have a degree in business or a degree in industrial psychology or, you know, mm -hmm. they say communication. Oh, wait, wait a minute, what is that? <laughs> and I have to explain to them the difference is that it begins from a basis of how people Talk, to, talk and listen to each other and how that interaction affects what really is happening in the organizational climate and culture. And once you get into it, they begin to, dis, inter, to understand it. But I think we have, maybe it's a real PR job to do to help people out there in the real world understand what we have to offer. And maybe that comes through, through the suggestion that was made that we do more interaction with some of the other organizations that, that are involved with that. Because I, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I know of various professions. One is in the area, for example, in conflict management, where the assumption is that you need to be a lawyer to do it. Well, that's the last kind of person who knows how to do it the way we, you know, the way we do. And I, and I, I speak with some authority on that from some experience. But I think that that's important. And there's one other thing that we have going for us that I'm trying to leverage right now, and that is. We understand millennials, digital natives, better than all these other people do because 
they're not in the daily classroom and in the daily right. grind with these people. We understand how this new this new big boom generation, is, you know, takes information and does something with it, or not, I shouldn't say just information, deals with their lives. And I think that's that's something that is unique for us coming out of the classroom. Let's go Mike and then Leanne. It seems to me that some of the best of what we provide out there to us seems a really natural process of actively listening to the client. What do they need? What data do they have to justify their worries or concerns? And the point, I think, is a simple one that I know everyone on this panel shares, and that is that training and development in almost every job that we do has a clear consultancy focus to it. Don, and I'm not going to generalize, but I probably will generalize anyway. He was talking <laughs> about uh, you know contractors that, that do government training work. Uh, in a lot of those cases, the, the question halfway through the session or at the end of the session is, well, were points 1 through 75 covered? You'll notice there's no mention of traction, skill development, you know, training transfer, et cetera. But, but the problem that we see, and I think one of the things that we bring to the table, perhaps uniquely, is that at square one, when we first get the phone call, our first uh, response is to ask questions and to listen and learn about their space and about their perceptions and what kind of data they have so that we can then go in and do some even more serious uh, TNA work, some training needs analysis work, and then go back to our offices and our labs and figure out what might be best to meet their needs. A lot of, I think, so-called traditional training models don't even talk about the consultancy aspect or the problem-solving aspect, and I think that's one thing that we are all geared, both through theory and practice, to do perhaps better than anybody else. Uh, the other thing I wanted to chime in with is that I think generally there are a lot of organizations that during this economic downturn are pulling their horns in, but it's been several of our experiences that the tougher times are getting, the better and healthier, uh, I'll go ahead and use Senge's term, learning organizations, this is the time when they are reinvesting, they're spending more, they're investing more, uh, because they understand that their competition is you know, pulling in their horns and saving a dollar or two. Uh, so during these tougher times, uh, we're finding that there are a lot of organizations that are not just maintaining their training budgets, but increasing them. And I would actually echo on that. There's a lot of organizations that are hiring because now you get as many first-round draft picks as you want. Mm -hmm. You're not competing against. Uh, I'm at the business school at USC, and we hired 22 faculty last year. And we only get a net gain of five or seven out of that. But our notion is this is a 20-year opportunity and we'll do it again next year, and, and we're hiring because this is our chance. And I think corporations that take this, and then students who take this, is this is a tremendous opportunity where people, uh, the, the traditional paths are broken, and people are looking for results, and if you can deliver, there's tremendous opportunities that you may not have had five years ago if you graduated, or five years ago in terms of training or consulting, where during the dot-com boom, they might have wanted to go with a top five company just so their company could say that their training was done by a particular company. Now, the VP of HR, their job's on the line, and they actually need people trained, and the people actually have to do that skill. So now they actually need people who can transfer training, who know adult learning, uh, and I think it's a good opportunity and a good place to be. Man. Um, and to add on to that, as, as businesses sort of retrench and reorganize, there's an increased emphasis on needing to maintain knowledge capital. So you have employees that um, are going to be given early retirement, and with them they take an incredible amount of organizational knowledge. So how do you set systems in place to continue to maintain knowledge capital so you're not, you might lose some individuals, but you don't lose organizational knowledge? Additionally, we have another challenge with working with organizations now that aren't just in Marietta, Ohio, but an organization in Marietta, Ohio also has a manufacturing plant in China. They deal with their... Um, publications are in their PR through a company in Bombay. And so how do we 
individualized training that gets at the same goal, but um, to borrow from our org conference, equifinality, that we can reach the same knowledge level, but through different avenues, through different methods that are culturally sensitive and, and sensitive to, to geographic and cultural boundaries. Scott? Um, well, I wanted to tap on to uh, what Don said earlier about people being confused about communication. Uh, as a discipline, I had to explain to my grandma how I was getting a Ph.D. in talking. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a great question she asked. Um, but one of the things that I think really distinguishes us as, uh, from a communication perspective, from the I.O. site people and the people coming out of business, is they are so focused on the behavioral and the knowledge-based goals. And there are three types of goals for training. There's affective, the value-based goals the uh, behavioral as well as the knowledge. And what I found is that I can easily get people to that knowledge-based interest and the behavioral interest if they care about the topic. And one of the things that distinguishes us is we have a natural tendency to walk in and start from a place that says, why do we need to embrace diversity? Why is that an important uh, piece? Why does it matter that we have trust in the organization? Why is it important to have ethics? Rather than the uh, famous um, uh, ethics training that was done in the Bush administration where everyone was brought in for a one-hour ethic training session every year, I think that we probably do a better job of that. Um, and to tap on to what Leanne was saying as well, what I'm hearing more and more with the baby boomers moving out is not only do we not un understand the millennials, but we need to have good succession plans in place for the people who are going to replace the baby boomers. And I see that as a tremendous opportunity for uh, the work that we do in the future. Yeah. Karen? Um, it, you know, I, I'd like to address this notion of state of the art currently because I know we're going to talk about the future in a minute. And people have kind of hinted at the notion of technology, but I think there's some things that are state-of-the-art right now that have to do with technology. And they're not future planning. They're the things that we're seeing when we review papers that are really, truly cutting edge now and today. So I thought I'd share, you know, some examples of things like that with you. And they do relate to technology, so I have to admit my own personal bias. That's the area I study is organizational technology. So obviously I'm going to have a bit of a technology bias there. But, um, you know, one of the things that increasingly we need to be doing, um, and we can use the fact that we have training and development backgrounds to help us do this, is how do we integrate into our classrooms new activities that teach them how to adapt to the reality they're going to face when they graduate and get a job. So, for example... Um, Something like 68% of all presentations in organizations now are being done via web conference. That's today, or a web seminar. They're being done in some type of virtual environment. We don't have a whole lot of research on that. Um, and we actually, our students don't know how to use that type of technology, yet they're being expected, and everyone thinks, since they're millennials, that when they graduate, oh yeah, they have all these you know, great skills. They haven't learned them from us. And so, for example, this semester, I, had all, I have all 50 of my students in my undergraduate, almost all senior class, they're doing all their final presentations via web conference. And I'm doing things like, oh, your client is located in, uh, in Shanghai. You need to figure out the appropriate time zone, and you will be, need to be online at that time for your client presentation. So, yes, in the next few weeks, I will be up at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and, you know, midnight. But that's the reality today of what we need to be thinking about and how we can apply um, getting people to actually practice today. And, that, and if we're not to that level today, we can't project, I think, a future. So we really, I think some people are needing to play catch-up in terms of um, the types of things that we need to be teaching people today. Um, other things that we're seeing increasingly in terms of, of state-of-the-art are teaching people to deal with things like uh, impression management considerations with Facebook and Twitter and all of these various technologies. Um, it's shocking to me how many people don't realize what kind of implications there are. And so that's an opportunity for us today, I think, that's really kind of state of the art. Just a quick tag team, which is great because Carrie and I mm -hmm. were co-chairs at the same time yeah. in this division, so we're good at <laughs> tag teaming. Um, there's also um, Second Life, which is online virtual environments. And many, many businesses are now in Second Life. Many colleges and universities are in Second Life. They're conducting 
Um, business meetings via video conference because you can live stream into Second Life. Um, Bill Clinton did one of his global initiative speeches streamed into Second Life. So that's another part of the state of the art that we have to grapple with because there is some technology that goes with that that we have to understand, but it's also everything we'd ever talk about in communication with identity management. Um, yes, you're an avatar, um, and you can create that avatar any way you'd like. Obviously, there's appropriate ways to do that, uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of identity management that goes with um, interacting there, but again, it's a, it's a new technology that's um, you know, taken off and grown exponentially that businesses are, are doing, and it's a great environment for students so you can get students in there and practice. So it's a great way to practice the skills we're talking, teaching them as well. I think when we talk about state of the art, there's in corporations, there's this real uh, gap opening up between companies that are very, very sophisticated and technologically savvy and those that just don't have technology. They have outdated software programs. They don't have any technology at all. They're using paper and pencil and carbon copy type stuff. And especially as we go global with many of these corporations that have facilities around the world, I had students doing a consulting project in, Me- in uh, China, in, throughout China, and it was a, a cement company. And it was simple. You do an ERP system with a dashboard and you implement it, except 22 of their sites didn't have electricity. Oh, wow. So as you start to do training and you go around the world, the, the cultural impact, the differences in terms of, of managing up, you may not be able to manage up. You may not even be able to talk to your boss in certain manners or appropriate ways and uh, gender issues and a lot of issues that come into play, I think the state of the art is beginning to realize the complexity of the audience has always been very diverse. It's even more diverse now. And when you do those three, four workshops, and when you're doing one in San Jose and one in Tokyo, one in Taipei and one in Singapore, they're very different audiences, but the corporation wants the same result in terms of ability of those individuals, and you have to go at it in different ways. And I think that the communication folks are pretty well situated for that. In terms of the next five years, it is a five-year out panel, and where is the division headed? And part of the discussion here is, what do we do between now and the next five years? Where do you see us headed? What do you think we can best spend our time on? If, if someone out there is thinking of writing a paper or putting together a panel, what, what helps the most in terms of moving the conversation forward, uh, helping people learn and grow? What, what are some of the thoughts? JD, do you want to start with that? And then we'll actually work our way across. Okay, this is an interesting question, and I, I anticipated it somewhat and, and threw it out to my LinkedIn team. Uh, and, and to uh, uh, well, which is an interesting team. I have a uh, interim CEO from a Fortune 100 company. I have an outsourcer from India. I have a consultant from uh, England. I have a ASTD something or other from LA. I mean, you know, it's a pretty diverse team in terms of of, of this thing. And and uh, I've decided to put it in an organizational scheme that at least I can remember most of the points um, from that famous. Uh, typology, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the ugly part of it is is that I think we are constrained by traditional models of the past and we're no longer in that past. And, and, some of, and we have reflected uh, some of those ugly things on this panel, uh, but we can't help ourselves because we're held hostage by the old paradigm. Uh, the good news is, is that it takes about 20 years to, for the paradigm to shift, so we're probably secure in a lot of those assumptions and those <laughs> uh, that are doing traditional training, it will probably be 20 years before you're unable to find opportunities uh, there. So uh, we do have that going for us. Uh, some of those things that we're thinking about is this idea that we have to do corporate training, we have to align ourselves with traditional organizations, which where we absolutely uh, don't. The porosity between the trainer and the potential trainees has never been better. Uh, we can access millions of individuals with uh, individualized training environments to people that we've never met, met put con- uh, uh, you know, congregates of, of individuals that are interested in our training environment together from across the globe uh, by being on the web. Uh, we do have to change our idea of uh, ownership in terms of our training. And as uh, one of my team members said, is that uh, uh, we have got to get over this idea that we own information, the, the idea that you will have the uh, training program that you can get, make a lucrative amount of money on is probably short-lived because that same program will come reify its ugly head on the Internet someplace else for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so rather than seeing ourselves 
as, as portrayers of those kinds of programs, uh, what we may want to do is be knowledge managers, certainly uh, 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 identify ourselves as the people that are able to put together these learning environments, these knowledge management systems for individuals that are out there from a variety of perspectives. So, I mean, you can, if you want to get into training right now, you can get into training this afternoon and be on the web. And uh, if you want to go to LinkedIn, you can go to their Q&A section, which basically is just we want some information kinds of stuff. Present yourself as an expert, and you can try your stuff out. And uh, if it's good enough, people will validate you. If it's not good enough, then they will invalidate you and say, you know, you were terrible. We don't want to hear from you again. Uh, so I, we do have those kinds of, of things. Another bad thing is that we have seen an educational shift in this country. Uh, certainly the online uh, universities have fundamentally shifted the way that we do education. And this is, this is going to change uh, individuals that we see in the workplace. Number one, we can have individuals in the workplace without a college degree because they can get a college degree while they're in place in the job. So, I mean, we're going to have uh, less educated people that need to be trained on skill sets that they need for that day. You know? so, so there's some opportunities still within organizations. Uh, there. At the same time, we have individuals that have no loyalties for companies. They're just trying to go around to wherever it is that they need to go. And so they will try to have personalized training systems. So they want to access those kinds of systems and try to find ways and venues to be able to access those systems. Uh, if we are trying to do the, the traditional face-to-face -face training, there are you know, tons of opportunities to do that. Uh, there is 20 years for us to be able to get those models. But if you want to be cutting edge in the next five years, I think we need to explore some of these more individualized spaces, some of these more mobile learning spaces, uh, individuals that are undereducated or, and I hate to say, no, I don't hate to say this, I need to say this, is that a lot of those online universities, they give degrees that undereducate their constituencies. And so what organizations are going to have to find out is ways to bring them up to at least threshold competencies, and they're going to use training as stopgap measures in order to be able to fill those spaces which is you know, great for us because then we can fill those stopgap you know, uh, situations. We have individuals, uh, university of <laughs> online, and they, they <laughs> don't have what they need to be able to function effectively in that space. Well, the organization recognizes that, and rather than saying, okay, let's fire them, uh, let's get them a degree, they'll put them in a training kind of environment, let's get them to threshold competencies. You have other individuals that are going to be reinventing themselves with these threshold competencies because they're going to uh, become more concrete of what the organization is expected. The college degree may not be the coin of the realm, but competencies in particular areas. And so I'm going to find individually individualized ways to be able to find those competencies, certifications, training kinds of things, networking with uh, individuals where name recognition may have more value than uh, a university degree. So you're networked with individuals that know you, know your space, know your uh, persona. And this idea about avatars, and it's like, old oh, people are going to be doing avatars. i got news for you. We're already doing avatars. You know, look at your Facebook page. That's not you. You know, <laughs> you have, you've had the Photoshopped or whatever. Or, you know, I've seen a couple of lizards. This is, you know, kind of stuff of how people portray themselves out there. So we're already into the avatar generation. It's not a second life kind of, of kind of thing. We're into that where people are trying to manage their identities, and at least we understand that, in ways that are fairly sophisticated. Unfortunately, the individuals that are trying to manage uh, their identities are probably doing it at the most immature time in their lives, and so you know, certainly the identities are reflective of that. Uh, hopefully we get a little bit better, but I think that's uh, some of the spaces and opportunities and, and barriers uh, that we have currently in place and then also in the next five years. If, actually, before we go to Don, let me add the, to, to tag on that if you look at the top five training topics in, in ASCD and their surveys every year, uh, there, there's a difference between someone getting a university degree at home who may be um, re-entering the workforce or may be very remote or such and the actual job skills that the corporation may be seeking. So what the corporations pay for in many cases is not for you to get a university diploma. It is specific training in presentation skills, management skills, uh, leadership skills. They're very interested in the specific skills that you'll do, and, and those tend not to be the online university. Yet the, there's the classic Dilbert where the, the evil HR guy flips someone a CD and say, here, uh, learn interpersonal skills, knock yourself yeah. out. <laughs> um, but I know corporations that have asked, well, do you have yeah. like an online program for interpersonal skills? Yeah. 
Or a CD. Or a CD, <laughs> or yeah, yeah. something. Can, can you watch? It's, it's like me learning to play golf, watching Tiger Woods. At, at some point, it's just not going to happen. So I think there's always a space for people who can train well. It'll always be there. Here's a, a quick tag team on that, though. But the, the thing you have to be careful of, J.D., is that um, our institutions become online. So we become them, and they become us. So I certainly know at ASU we're having a huge online effort because we need to compete yeah. with the traditional online universities. So that well, said... Well, you're in a unique space right there. And, boy, this is a pet peeve of, of, of mine. The online spaces... All of ours. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> online spaces need to be populated by robust education and yeah. training. Yes. But what we find out is that they go down to the least common denominator. So you have people doing podcasts of lectures, and so instead of having an interactive environment... And so now the has and the have-nots are not the, the haves have technology and the have-nots don't. We have the have-nots having technology-mediated environments that are repetitions and no interaction, mm -hmm. where the haves actually have the face-to-face -face kinds of environments where there is interaction and they're able to deal with unique kinds of situations and learn how to think. I was talking to one of the panelists uh, earlier, and this is probably uh, no surprise to you that we belong to the Twitter generation, 140 characters or less, that's how they think. Uh, and I was corrected on that in, in one place, and they said, no, 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 we're the Facebook generation. All right, 90 characters are left. Let's look at the posts on Facebook. Uh, the long narratives, the nuanced kinds of understandings of things, we're losing that, uh, mainly because of technology shifting the middle uh, models, and we can go to on, you know, how you know, technology defines various generations in, in terms of, of how they think, and we're going back to more of the oral traditions, but the problem is it's an oral tradition that is constrained with a very, very short attention span. So now the storyteller gets 40 words. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a very difficult environment. We're going to need trainers to be able to support that kind of environment because these individuals do not have the richness to be able to uh, deal with unique situations, so they're going to be looking for information and access information and, and re-education experiences where they can access that information, and that's certainly a training situation as opposed to maybe a long-term education situation. Sorry. Don, where else do you see us headed? <laughs> okay. Well, I see myself as a, uh, in, in some ways as a dinosaur in that old paradigm of, of JDs, but, I, yeah, um, but I'm good for 20 years, so that, that <laughs> puts me in a good shape. But Really not, either, because I'm very much aware of the problem that, that uh, some of the digital natives are having these days with their identity. There's kind of an identity crisis there. And if you haven't practiced, if you haven't been in a situation where you practice vigorous interaction skills with other people, how can you, you, know, how can you develop the kind of self-concept that probably is, is very important? I think there's an awful lot about... Uh, online learning that we don't know that people in a lot of different disciplines are looking at today. Uh, we're kind of in a comfortable spot at the smaller university that I teach at. For example, the graduate program uh, that I work with, we have consistently asked our graduate students, how many online courses do you want? How many hybrid courses do you want? And I've taught hybrid courses, in other words, half online, half in the classroom, because I thought that was more convenient for them. The students want regular coursework, and the typical statement is a simple one. I sit in front of a computer all day. Why would I want to go to school on a computer? What, what's that going to do for me? And we work very hard to develop that, that sense of shared learning teams and a learning community that is terribly important to them that they, don't, they can't experience when they're online. So that's just one very simple, simple reaction. But I think there's so much that's very fascinating about the way people listen and learn that, that we have to bring to this, this discussion. And we have to do it in a way where we're not just talking about information transmission, but we're talking about all of the other affective and identity elements that go with it. Carrie? I have four main things that I think um, communication scholars are in a unique position to focus on in the very short term, the next five years. Um, the first one is that increasingly we're seeing people who used to have specialized jobs at work be asked to do multiple things. And so there's a proliferation in the rhetoric surrounding multitasking and the desirability to do this. And increasingly uh, in, in workplaces with anyone who's over 30, and it's actually really over 30, um, they are 
they are frustrated with the fact that they're being asked to do a lot more things than what they were in the past. And I think that's something that we as communication scholars have a lot to say about. We can help them cope with managing all of these multiple new tasks. We can go in and in a very customized and specialized learning environment help them learn to cope with this communicative multitasking that seems to be a trend happening. Um, The second area is, once again, another opportunity we have in organizations to help people. Several people have mentioned generational differences. Um, I think that it's very hot. There's lots of buzz right now about how we're going to get these generations to get along at work. Many people, when they find out what I do, ask me, can you come in and teach them some manners? Can you teach them not to (laughs) And, and on the surface, that's what they're asking. But deep down, and it's something that's gone along, and you can read the research on the generational research, and even though we claim they're different, a lot of the problems are exactly the same that we've had with every generational difference. Um, there's just a lack of understanding that they grew up with slightly different tools. And so I think that we could take our experience from the past. We have done this type of training before, and I think we're in a unique position to go in and help them Learn to talk to each other between the, the, the um, generations. And I don't think you have to be a technology expert to facilitate that incredible um, the talk that can happen between generations. The third area that I think is really hot for the next five years is, um, is coming up with ways to help people handle overload. I mean, we now have these blasted things attached to us, don't we? Um, increasingly, people are talking about how much email they get. Um, the fact that we have to be always on, always available, always accessible, you know, what are the implications of this? This is a highly communicative thing that people are talking about, and they recognize our communication discipline as someone who can help them in this over-communicating world. And then the fourth trend is this notion of meetings. I really do see that we have lots of different ways that people are meetings, are meeting, and communication scholars can help with meeting etiquette, they can help with um, the different meeting formats, be they online, in person, um, and so I, I think that's kind of the fourth thing. And, the, and I, I have one more thing that I won't count as a fourth thing, but I will offer it as a thought, um, as, a, as something you can think about. When my, my I have a, a 10-year-old daughter and a 6-year-old son, and when the people at my kids' elementary school find out what I do, do you want to know what the number one thing that the parents ask me? Would you hold a workshop for these fourth graders and get them to learn to talk face-to-face? I think that the more we talk about technology, the more people are going to value good old-fashioned face-to-face communication skills. In all my research, the value of being able to carry on a face-to-face conversation is never going to go away. And so I actually think that that's going to rise again. It might not be in five years. It might be in ten years. That might be the hot training topic is how do we get these people to talk because everything they've done has been online. Pete? I'm going to go ahead and take this in just a slightly different direction with the departure. I think... When looking at in five years where we should be and or how we can provide the most positive benefit uh, 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 for society and, and uh, beneficiary, uh, being beneficiaries of what it is that we can do, I think there are sort of three things. I'm sort of looking at this now as far as what is it that we as trainers, I, and something I, I think that John had mentioned there uh, about being, you know, uh, be, be, being well trained and being able to train, uh, train people well, recognize that the best kinds of trainers, our job is not so much to be the point person in the presentational training itself, but to facilitate a learning environment that's going to be conducive to helping the trainees achieve whatever goals they are and what they, they need to achieve. And I think along those lines, there are probably three things that I, that I would think that in the next five years are, are going to become crucial. One, uh, and uh, this may certainly differ between the different kinds of programs uh, that are represented up here, but I know that in terms of the, uh, the full facade of understanding what the training and development field is about, um, we, in, at least at our university, uh, really sort of have this strong division between our training and communication uh, development course is focused primarily in face-to-face, and I think it, it needs to be much more along technology. Now, part of the problem there is we've got one of those funky little political turf battles where the technology parts of things in terms of learning to use instructional technology, various kinds of web design techniques, are housed in another department, so they're sort of revolting. We're not allowed to, to go that realm. But as far as if we're looking at certification kinds of programs or 
or collaborative programs or crossover programs to meet some of these needs uh, that J.D. was mentioning about in terms of uh, uh, failures to provide uh, employees who are properly trained and or equipped with the kinds of skills that they need, um, then our understanding of how to facilitate the best use of this technology, I think, is mandatory. So it's not just in terms of um, talking good, in terms of what that degree is that, that we're focusing in terms of communication, but recognizing, uh, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the multimodal aspects of understanding it. Uh, just this past summer, I did a three-week training session for a uh, consortium of uh, rural hospitals uh, in uh, southern Illinois, which was a real interesting challenge for me, uh, given the use and the limitations of those kinds of technology. How does one design an effective learning environment when you've got that many kinds of restrictions? It's still sort of, in one sense, it's real time, but you're talking about very limited kinds of feedback and all the other kinds of things associated with teletraining. So our understanding of how that technology affects this process, I think, is, is, is a first criteria where in the next five years, that needs to be a focus, the impact of technology on the training process and, indeed, how it affects the learner's environment. The second element that I think is, uh, is, is increasingly important just goes back to uh, accountability, and that is that training professionals need to, I think, have a better understanding and to do more uh, competent assessment uh, in terms of evaluations of their programs and in terms of assessing what the needs are for those various constituents that they're going to be working with. Um, the ability to understand how to really get at the kinds of answers that we need to develop effective learning strategies and to facilitate that kind of learning environment, I think, it is also critical. And oftentimes, it's not simply uh, talking to one person and getting that one individual's view on, oh, this is what we need. Okay, well, great. This is what we'll provide. Now, what they think they want and what they actually may need may, to be, may be two completely different things. So understanding how to do that both at the front end and also at the back end to be able to demonstrate the objectives and the effectiveness of various kinds of technologies and, and learning decisions uh, in that uh, strategic planning is important. The, uh, the third and final thing that I'll mention in terms of five years out and looking at where we can make perhaps the, the biggest difference, again, will be, I think, looking back at home, looking at taking our knowledge of understanding what facilitates active learning environments and not worrying even about taking it uh, in sort of a consultancy model outside the doors of academe, but rather reflecting it back into academe to prepare better students, to prepare people who are better able to meet these kinds of needs and challenges. Um, as we said, we know what effective learning demands and we know what should be done right. Right. And uh, my guess is that 95% uh, of the classrooms on our modern universities do not do it right. They still fall under the, uh, the old pedagogical uh, objectives and assumptions about how people need to learn and that what I need to think you need to learn is the important thing, not what you think is, is important. So I think that uh, in terms of our, our development in our division, uh, focusing some of those aspects reflected back into the institution. We see lots of case studies about various kinds of companies, small and large companies, uh, multinational corporations, and how training development can be effectively engaged in those kinds of venues. And we really see very little in terms of panels about reflecting it back into our classroom. How do we go about changing our colleagues? Uh, Lord knows, giving somebody a PhD gives them an ego the size of a football field. And so trying to suggest to them that their learning models may be, dare we say, antiquated, uh, may uh, be sort of a hard task to do. And yet that may be one of the most immediate and the most rewarding uh, venues where this knowledge and experience can be put into play. Yeah. As long as you have time. As long as you have tenure, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. great. Um, and to build on something Pete said, uh, and I think we all know this, anybody who's ever sat through any kind of an orientation session that's gone on and on, and then about three weeks later you go to HR and say, now what do I need to do to get this? Um, that the knowledge means most to us when it's on demand, what we think we need to learn. And so I think a continuing challenge for us as a profession and as a discipline in terms of research is to find ways to meet individuals' demands. I'm sitting at my desk. I just dealt with a difficult customer. I go, geez, I have no idea how to do this. Let me phone up Leanne Gray Starner and see if she can give me something right now that I can look through, a little video clip, or she can stop by during lunch and give me a little 30-minute primer where we debrief what happened, why it went the way it did, and what to do differently the next time, is developing some sort of on-demand training that, that something is available when I think I need to know it, and then it becomes much more relevant for me in terms of information transfer, knowledge transfer, skills transfer. So some kind of just-in-time training um, in terms of technologies, but also face-to-face, -face, um, is uh, an avenue that I think 
is going to be fruitful in terms of both research and development. Mike? Just-in-time training is a great concept unless it leads us into thinking that information transfer equals training. Yep. We're not in the information transfer business when we're in the training and development role. And, God, how, excuse me, how many dozen programs have we had over the years that starkly contrast the teaching versus the training function? So I think we need to keep those, those clear. Second, and I'm echoing what my colleagues have already said about technology. Uh, if I tried to summarize, at least from my 20 years, huh? from my perspective, <laughs> I think we need to focus on harnessing technology and make it work for us rather than allowing the technology to become the driver. Uh, and I say that because it interrelates with my biggest concern, and that is the ongoing need for us to measure the transfer of training. We don't do enough of it. And in particular, I'm personally interested in, in assessing the durability of that training transfer. Uh, the fact that we can get people to begin developing skills by the end of a three-day training session, that's great. Hopefully the organization will reinvest in bringing us back to do follow-ups. I don't hear a lot of my colleagues talking about all the follow-up work they're doing and I know it's not because they're not capable. It may simply be uh, the economies of scale being what they are. You know, we have to you know, draw the line somewhere. Uh, but that durability uh, construct, how long does the training transfer those new skills? How long do they last? How soon do we need a re-inoculation, a retraining, if you will? And then under the, uh, under the, the retraining umbrella, uh, I, I think there's this need for under the heading of multitasking, uh, all of the new challenges that old dogs are being asked to, to demonstrate, as well as bringing the new kids on board. Uh, we need training programs for them, not just one-shots, but systematic programs. Uh, final thought that I, I think I'm optimistic about is that with the wealth of training skills and knowledge that we have, I would hope that in the next five years we will see more of us taking on larger consultancies as teams of professionals. Uh, we network well enough. We can network faster and more effectively now than ever before. It's just not that hard to get a hold of anybody anywhere, anytime, in the, any place in the world. We should be able, in a relatively efficient manner, be able to compare and contrast our thoughts, our notes, our concerns, our our uh, questions, if you will, about a particular organization's challenges and put together a team of professionals who are credible, uh, who are qualified, and, and who are diverse enough to handle whatever the situation is. And we should be able to be the best of the best among team builders, among ourselves, and then we can go in and do the kind of consultancy work, problem solving, et cetera, troubleshooting that the organization actually needs. Uh, I'm actually going to tap off to a few things that Mike said. One of the things that makes me very optimistic is we're telling our current uh, graduates that between now and when they retire, they're going to have 14 different careers. So earlier, uh, JD said the employees aren't as loyal, etc. I think we have a completely different type of employee. I think we have a free agency situation that we're looking at. But one of the things, if you tap into that, that means that our, our recent college graduates expect to change careers every three and a half years. And it's an organizational reality that means that the need for training is fantastic because they're going to have to have people who come in and help them uh, get to this level. Uh, Mike said, started to step into the idea of development, and that's one of the concerns I have with a lot of things that I've been hearing is that we're talking a lot about training, but we're not talking a great deal about development. And I think that that's really where our, our distinct, unique opportunities in the future are at. Uh, I've attended the uh, conference at Aspen on engaging scholarship for the last several years. There are two quotations that I want to pull out of that conference. Uh, Pam Shockley Zalabach several years ago started the conference by saying she believes the 21st century is the communication century, period. And that if we're not prepared to be able to go out there and help people in that area, then we're really missing the boat. Um, but the second part is where I see a distinction between training and development is training often is we, we walk into an organization with solutions to their problems. Uh, what I love about a quote from Stan Dietz at the Aspen Conference a few years ago was he said, I think solutions are worthless. 
What we need to know is not the solution. How did we get into the problem in the first place? And way too often what we do is we walk into an organization and we listen to a manager tell us what the problem is and we go, oh, okay, here's my answer, here's my solution to it. And we get in the middle of the training and we end up finding out that the problem that we've been told is not the problem at all. Right. Um, what we really need to do is engage with the scholars who are starting to work towards engaged scholarship, and this is across a variety of disciplines, uh, whether that's organizational, advocacy, social justice, uh, applied communication, ethnography, and really start to grapple with the idea of how do we engage our scholarship towards finding out how to help organizations and then be able to learn from those organizations as to whether or not the things that we are advocating actually work. Uh, I think that we're a prime place to be doing that. And if in the next five years we don't take advantage of that, I think that we uh, will be sorely uh, lacking for an opportunity. John? I'm going to take a normative approach and say what we ought to be doing for the next five years, very much echoing what we've heard here. First, regarding research, and we've talked a little bit about that today, I think we need to keep focusing on publishing our own research in our own journals, and we've talked about that as, as a need and even some spotlight issues on training development as we've tried to do through ComEd. But I think we need to be thinking expand, more expansive than just ComEd as a particular journal in which we can publish in our own discipline. But secondly, to Scott's point earlier, if we're going to make the case for what we do as important and informing other professional practices and other associations, being able to reach out to the other associations' publications, which are as high quality as ours in their domains, and make the case that, yes, what we do in communication is very useful, informative, and adds value to the professional practice of training and development as a profession beyond us as academics in um, communication. So I think there's a lot of research venues for us we need to explore internally to NCA and externally to make the cases substantially that what we have to offer as scholarship has a lot of value. Um, the part two to that is what we've discussed also that Michael uh, Foz here has had, had headed up a few years ago that really never came to fruition, but would certainly, I think, be a value is, again, an edited text, as we discussed, of the folks in this room who, who do t and and do a nice edited um, uh, textbook uh, of sorts that documents the, the stuff we're talking about. And all the, you know, we could do it past, present, future. There's a number of ways we could create that. And I think that would be a nice thing for us to actually bring to fruition from a research perspective um, to talk about the scholarship we have to offer. Secondly, I do think it's important, though, that we think about how we teach our students this topic. So going back to what I said earlier about our undergraduate curriculum and our graduate curriculum, I think in the next five years we ought to be thinking about, again, how can we formalize a scope and sequence, kind of like we think through ORCOM or PR and those types of disciplines. Because as you've heard, I think the, the future is right for work for our students that will graduate as with their bachelor's or, or master's degrees. And I think that we, we can do a lot to inform that process through our internal committees, et cetera, and think about the cross-disciplinary courses that should inform that outside our discipline to complement what we can provide our, our students, undergrads and graduates. And then finally, um, in spite of all the great technology, I think one of the great default things we can land on that will give us a lot of staying power even past 20 years, Don, so don't, don't worry, is uh, process. I mean, I think this, Pete talked about that earlier. I mean, we are process experts. We think through process, I think, as a discipline. We, we do that better than most. And regardless of the technology, regardless of the online functions, X, Y, and Z, it all comes down to the process and, and understanding whatever we do in training and development goes through a process of steps, stages, and phases that we can walk our institutions through, our clients through, um, and any form of content that we address or the technology we address needs to go through a process that's tried and true um, and if we violate that process, we're going to have outcomes that we are probably unintended. So those are things I think going forward in five years we, we can focus on and think about. Thank you. I think as we look five years out, the, the challenge is, and I, I think is to get everyone here, all of us, engaged and involved. And as you're sitting there, hopefully you're thinking you know, how you can be part of that over the next five years how what you do in the university uh, with organizations or corporations and training and development, um, how you become part of that or more involved in that uh, to help drive this so that it is more central, so it is more beneficial uh, to members, not just in the training development division, but throughout NCA, throughout our universities uh, and the broader communities. One way uh, immediately is our business meeting is Saturday. I've got to pitch that. Yeah. Uh, Saturday at uh, 1230. 
uh, we will have great door prizes because I've seen some of them. Uh, so it's 12.30 and it's over in the Palmer House. And the business meeting, especially for students, we hold elections or student representatives. So if you're a student and want to become more involved in training development, uh, we do elect a number of students as representatives. And I, I think as I, I want to take the, the final minute or two to really thank the panelists. And um, I think it's given us a lot in terms of where to go and a place to come back each year to see you know, how we're progressing. And I think the, the challenge for all of you is how you might want to be a part of that, how you want, want to participate, help shape, help create that future. So I do want to thank JD, Don, Carrie, Peter, Leanne, Michael, Scott, and John for giving their time today. We have time for basically one, maybe one. <laughs> if you're 60 words or less, we have time for two questions. Otherwise, there's one. If you have, and we'll also stick around. Uh, we, we actually believe a lot in networking, so if you want to talk to us, we'll stick around. There is a question there. Oh. This is more a statement. So mm-hmm. I, get I just assigned virtual groups to a small group class, and almost none of my students had ever worked in a virtual group before. Mm-hmm. We make That was under 60 words. <laughs> and there was one more right there. Uh, I noticed a video of our recording this. It'd be interesting. I think yes. some of my students in a TND class or possibly here this yes. and uh, maybe some of the students are available. Uh, well, actually, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about not only the photographs. We, we have the um, uh, website, ncatraininginddevelopment.com. And... Uh, not just get pictures, see if we can stream it on there as well, put it into some components or something like that. So I'll work with them on it. It's um, uh, ncatraininginddevelopment.com, all one word. Uh, and that we're going to talk more about the business meeting. It's an outlet where we have a lot of information. Uh, we're moving some of the papers, so we have a panel on uh, case studies, and then we'll post all the case studies. So if you're teaching, you can just download five, six case studies to use for your students. So there's a lot of resources for people who are teaching or training or things like that. So I'd like to thank you for your time, and we'll be up here if you'd like to talk to us more. Thank you. Thank you.